Hey guys, you may have noticed I haven't posted a video for a little while. I do apologize. We've been really, really busy with a few things, had some sickness in the family. Um, so just to give you a quick update, what we've been so busy with, we've made a bunch of huge improvements on mink land and that's taken a lot of work and a lot of hours away from um, editing videos. Also, we had a big, big day ratting, like totally slaughtered our last record. We're talking over 250 rats in one day. It was crazy. So anyway, that video footage, a lot of you guys don't understand how much effort and time it takes to edit a video like that. We're talking four cameras running for five hours each. So if you guys imagine that's 20 hours of footage that I have to chop up and mix down and, and consolidate to a quick little, you know, 20, 30, 15 minute video. Um, I'm gonna throw this video in today. This is a, an older video that we've had on our Vimeo channel for a few weeks. And then just so you know, we've got a couple exciting videos coming up. Um, one, I'm gonna show you all the updates we've done on the property and two, we're gonna show you this crazy ratting video that, that I was just describing. So stay tuned, we've got a lot of good stuff coming and I'll try and get it to you in a more timely manner than I have been. So appreciate you for watching. Okay. Good morning, little guys. Hey guys, good morning. How are you? Uh, how are you? Oh, that's a little girl. Oh, that's a little boy. Okay. Let's see if I can do this without making a mess. Alrighty, let's go feed Lammy. Oh, good morning! Oh, good morning! Okay, everyone. What else I... Lammy. So, Lammy is a dairy lamb. So not very many sheep are bred for producing milk. Unlike goats, they're not natural big producers of milk. So sheep uh, naturally produce milk for a very short period of time and not very much quantity because their milk is really, really rich. It's not as watered down as like cow's milk and, and uh, goat's milk. So because it's so rich, they don't need to feed as much to their babies. And uh, their babies develop quickly so they don't feed them very long. So, uh, be people have developed breeds of sheep, uh, she's being one of them, that are made specifically for producing larger quantities of milk for longer periods of time. So whereas the typical sheep would produce milk for maybe, oh, three or four months, maybe a little longer if you're lucky, and not produce very much quantity, a sheep like her, you could expect to produce milk for six to eight months and uh, produce about a half a gallon a day. Alrighty, so let's uh, let's get feeding the baby mink. When they get hungry, they start fighting. So let's get going here. You guys ready to get out, huh? This is Axel and Saber. They are Brock and Rio's sons. And we've decided to try another experiment and see if we can bond to both of them at the same time. Usually we just bond to one baby mink at a time. And um, I've never tried to do multiples, so we're going to try and do multiples today. Or today. <laughs> this season. And this is little Mr. Axel. He doesn't have any white marks. He's just pure brown. And this is Mr. Saber. And he's got a little saber tooth hanging out of the side of his face. A little, little white mark that looks like a saber tooth. So we called him Saber. You guys ready to go, huh? 
So now that they're six weeks old, well, they're actually six and a half weeks old, they're old enough to start on some walks. Yesterday we did a few little walking around the yard, kind of back and forth is all. Today we're gonna to take them down the street a little bit. And then as they mature, we'll eventually start taking them to waterways, you know, little lakes and, and streams. We're going? Okay, let's go. These are soon to be laying hens. We have barred rocks, we have some set slinked. When they grow up, they should be producing us some eggs. Uh oh, okay, come help daddy. You come on, come do it. I'll do it. Yeah. Every morning we gotta clean the mink cages. So we got it set up with the plastic over the wire so it's nice and soft on their feet. But unfortunately, some of the mink don't take advantage of the open spot I give them. See, I, I leave it wire at the back so they could go to the bathroom there and it keeps the cage clean. But some of them, like Bear here, are pigs and for what... <laughs> you see, he's pooped on the plastic. Brock, if you notice, all the poop went off where it's supposed to be. Some of the mink do it, some of them don't. But we're going to spray it off, get it all clean. Yeah, I'll let him do it. I'll let him do it? Okay, I'll let him do it. I'll get the scraper in. Let's get the scraper in. Olive, bring me the scale. Olive. Olive, hey, bring me this gift. <laughs> Come on. Thank you. This is a mixture of rabbit, muskrat, beaver, and chicken. We weigh out their exact uh, portions. We don't want the mink to get too fat, but we obviously don't want to underfeed them. So what we do. While they're standing up, we get a good look at how much fat they have on them. And if you look down here at his back legs, you can see he's got a little bit of fat. He's not obese, but he's got a little more than he probably should have, but really not anything to be concerned about. Come back here, Brock. You see he's got just a little bit of tubby between his legs. That's a nice, comfortable fat. That's as fat as you want him. You don't want him any fatter than that. And he could he could stand to lose a little bit of weight. Come back here, Brock. Let me see your chubby again. Okay. Stand up. See, he's got just enough chub. He's a comfortable chub. No fatter than that. Okay, so Brock, when he gets 130 grams, he either maintains or gains just a little bit of weight. So we're going to feed him just a little less because he's starting to get a bit chubby. So we're feeding him 119 grams. And that's twice a day. We feed him twice a day. Now the females just got done weaning babies, so we're gonna give them plenty of extra, help them get some fat back on them. So this is for Taz. Taz doesn't eat very much. She's a little smaller than the other females. So we're gonna give her right on a little over 100 grams. And the reason we put it on top of the wire is to keep it clean. If you put it down on the bottom, they'll step on it it's down where they poop and pee sometimes. You just want to keep it as sanitary as you can and up on the wire helps. It also helps to make sure they don't waste as much, it doesn't fall through the wire and just go on the ground. So, so now everything's fed and watered. It is cleanup time and Shirni helps me with that. Take it. We're just gonna go clean up the yard. Get here. Good girl. Hey, good girl. You're such a good girl. Oh, you're such a good helper. Oh, you're such a good helper. Yeah. You're such a good helper. Okay, so I just cleaned out the litter box. 
And one thing that I do, it's a nice little trick, is I have kitty litter on the bottom layer. And kitty litter does really good at soaking up moisture and uh, keeping things smelling fresh even when they're not so fresh. <laughs> The problem with straight kitty litter is it sticks to their bum, and if it's a girl, it sticks to the little lady parts when they go pee. Because uh, any moisture, it sticks to it. So moisture from their bum or their or their private parts, it sticks and it causes quite a bit of discomfort. So you don't want to use straight kitty litter. So I put kitty litter on the bottom to absorb the moisture and the smell, and then I use something like this. This is just uh, recycled paper pellets. You could also use wood pellets. You could also use uh, that ground cob corn whatever you have available. Uh, this is one of my favorites is the paper pellets. This is recycled paper pellets. So you just put that on the top and basically protect them from the kitty litter underneath. And if you just use these pellets, it tends to smell more than if you don't. So it's kind of the, the best of both worlds. It's safe and comfortable for the meat and it doesn't smell to us humans. Lammy, what are you doing inside? You don't have a diaper on. When Lammy was little, for the first two weeks, we would let her inside and just put a diaper on her. And we would continue doing that. But the problem is, is she started chewing on stuff. And uh, she'd chew on cords and all kinds of stuff. So we couldn't leave, let her inside anymore. So now she's an outside only. Um, and she's been that way for a couple weeks. And um, But before, yeah, we'd actually let her inside with a diaper on so that she didn't... Uh, didn't mess in the house, but she could run around with us. Okay, Lemmy, outside. 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 Good girl. Sorry, you guys stay outside now. Okay, so now it's dog feeding time. So I feed my dogs mostly a raw diet. Um, back when I only had one or two dogs, I fed strictly a raw diet, but now that I've got, you know, several dogs, it's hard to get that much meat to feed all the mink and the dogs. Uh, so, I, uh, to, uh, basically, um, supplement their diet of, of wild raw food, which consists of, you know, beaver and muskrat and all kinds of stuff, rabbit, I also feed them some, uh, chicken. This is just cheap chicken from the store. And then I give them a chicken thigh and then a hunk of chicken liver. So because these chicken thighs don't have any organ meat, they need both muscle meat, they need a little bit of fat, and they need some bone. You can't feed them just muscle meat, they'll starve to death. They need to have bone for calcium and phosphorus, they need to have a little fat for energy, and they need to have some organ meat. So since this is not a complete diet, just giving them a chicken thigh, I buy the chicken liver separate and give them a chunk of chicken liver with their thighs. Hey boss. Sure need no. You wanna drink the blood? You guys go drink the blood. Okay and then I just these big dogs I just give a thigh. And you can thaw it out or you could give it to them kind of soft frozen like this. It helps clean their teeth. And I'm not gonna bother thawing it out. So this, this is a really expensive bag of dog food. It's something like $45, $50 a bag, and it's only 40 pounds per bag. So I mean, that's a, that's a lot. So uh, we'll use this. It's mostly meat, really high quality, really high energy. So we'll feed that in addition to the raw meat, just kind of when we're running low on meat. In the winter, we feed very, very little of this because we have lots of raw meat. There's, there's other sources of meat that we can utilize. Um, people are hunting deer, so we got deer scraps. And um, people are also hunting geese. We'll get lots of, um, what they'll do is they'll shoot like 20, 30 geese and they'll just cut out the breast meat and throw the rest away. So you've got legs, neck, backs, and internal organs from geese. We'll get piles of that stuff from geese hunters, duck and goose hunters. So during the winter, we have tons and tons of food. During the summer, it's not as much. So we don't have scraps from deer hunters and scraps from goose hunters and all of that to utilize. So we use some of this dog food, the really high quality dog food to help tie us over during the summer months. And during the winter months, it's pure raw. I, that we, we honestly have to find ways to store the meat so it doesn't go bad we have so much. Uh, but during the winter or during the summer, we'll use chicken from the store 
and some of this uh, high quality dog food to help tie us over during the lean times of the summer. And by feeding it frozen like this, it helps to clean their teeth, grinds their teeth off. You don't need to do that with some of the bigger boned animals. Like if you're, if you're feeding deer scraps or goose, their bones are really hard and they will clean their teeth. But this chicken from the store, they have really crappy bones. They're really soft and mushy and they don't do much to clean the dog's teeth. So I'll often feed it frozen just to help give them something to chew on. Um, when I'm feeding something like a beaver or like a goose or deer scraps, I don't feed it frozen unless, I don't typically froze, feed it frozen because the bones will clean their teeth good enough. Okay, one thing I wanna show you is, you wanna look at, people don't know how much to feed their dogs and obesity is a ridiculously out of control in this country when it comes to feeding pets. So one thing you wanna do with a working dog and in your pet, you really you should do, so you want to keep an eye on their fat, how fat they get. Boss is about as fat as he should ever be. This is almost too fat, just barely, but almost too fat. You can't see his ribs at all. If you look, you can see a slight outline of his ribs. So that means he's okay, he's not obese. He's just a hair on the side of being a little fat. You should, with a slick dog like this with a short coat, you should be able to see a little bit of his ribs, just barely, to, um, if you can see his, his whole rib cage, obviously that's skinnier than you want it. Come here, boss, come here. If you can't even detect ribs, your dog's obese, and you really need to get them on a diet and get them some exercise. So how I feed my dogs is I just keep an eye on their weight, just like I do the mink, I check their weight. How you doing today? Oh, you're a little bit skinny, oh, you're a little bit fat, whatever, and I feed them accordingly. So if you look at Shirni, she's uh, a little bit hairier than Boss, so it's not as defined. But you can see she's, she's on the heavy side a little bit. She doesn't have quite the waist she needs. And if I feel her ribs, her, her ribs are quite dull. So I'll be backing her off a little bit and feeding her a little bit less the next few days to get it so you could, she's a little bit more defined and not quite as fat. Now this is okay, this isn't, like I said, this isn't a problem. It just means if it progresses and she continues to get fatter, she will become overweight very quickly because she's right on the edge of being overweight right now. Why is it bad being fat? So being fat, so I used to be in life insurance and um, help people get their life insurance. You know, it's interesting is being overweight they're gonna give you a lower health rating if you're overweight than if you're a smoker. So people, everyone knows smoking's bad. They all oh, tobacco, give you cancer, yada, yada, yada. Actually, if you're overweight, it, it actually causes more problems for your body than smoking. So, I mean, that's a pretty drastic thing right there because you know, everyone knows smoking's horrible. It gives you enzema, it, it gives you cancer, it gives you all kinds of things. Well, being overweight causes a lot of problems on our body, puts stress on our joints, put stress on our heart and uh, same with animals it causes the same problem so if we're not watching our animals diet and making sure they're eating not just the right food but the right amount of food you're gonna have health problems so for a few hours a day we let the chickens run once sometimes twice a day so these chickens aren't very big right now they're roughly the size of a pigeon probably a little less than a pigeon so any little Cooper's hawk or whatever flying through could eat them. And there's always the risk that if the dogs get bored, they might take a chomp at them too. Even a good dog, when just laying around, a good hunting dog will sometimes get into mischief. So we don't leave them out for temptation. We're gonna put them away, let them run for a couple hours a day, but we're not gonna leave them out all day. So I use sure need to help round them up. Right now it's really easy because they're little and they stay in the same area, but as they get older and they start wandering, it's going to be more and more useful to have Shirini help me with this. So it's really convenient to get the idea in her head, well the chickens are close and they stay pretty close to their little little cage. Come on Shirini. Way back. Way back. Good girl. Good dog. Yes. Come on. Good girl. Okay, way back. Way back. Good girl. Good girl. Oh, we missed one. Good girl. Okay, we missed one. Come back over here. Way back.
Okay, come on. Get down. Get down. So some people say they'll call uh, German Shepherds or Dutch Shepherds or Malinois. They're in the herding family. They're not, they may be in the herding family, but they're not a herding dog. If you've ever seen a Border Collie or a, a Kelpie work, she does not have any of the instinct or skill or natural ability that they are born with. But she's really smart and she figures out what I want her to do and she does it anyway. But I would not call her a herding breed. I think you could get a Labrador or a pit bull or any other random dog that wants to please you and probably accomplish the exact same thing with just as much work. Um, she's smart, willing to please, that's the only reason she does it. People like to say they're a herding dog. They're not really a herding dog. They may be in the herding family, but they haven't been bred to herd anything for like close to a hundred years. So she's just using her smarts and her desire to please me to figure out what I want. So she's a good dog. Alrighty, so now we've taken care of all the other animals. We've fed and put the chickens away and watered and cleaned cages. Now it's time for me to eat. I'm hungry. Come on. Alrighty, so now everyone else is taken care of. It's time for us to eat. And this morning we're having a delicious breakfast of Salvadorian pupusas. That's where my wife comes from. Maggie comes from El Salvador. So we're going to have some pupusas for breakfast. And um, I'm also going to have a little side of these uh, radishes our neighbor gave us. Our neighbor grew some, some radishes and a bunch of other stuff and gave it to us this morning on our walk. So. So we're going to have some radishes with pupusas. And yes, you eat pupusas with your fingers. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> Kind of like pizza. Yeah. So anyway, we'll get done with breakfast and we'll show you guys some more. So now I've had some breakfast and we've got all the animals Ooh. taken care of. We're going to do a little bit of training. Shirini, come here. <laughs> so since the mink are all too little to do much training with them, we're training the dogs today. So boss has been having an issue with he doesn't understand when I'm telling him to get on the other side of the canal. Sometimes when you're out hunting, you'll, you'll see something on the other side of the canal. Let's say a raccoon or maybe a rat, but the dogs don't see it. And the animal might be visually still there and the dogs don't see it. Or maybe you saw it for an instant and it's gone, but you know the scent is still there. So you want the dogs to get on the other side so they can pick up the scent and follow. Whatever the case may be, it happens from time to time that you see something on the other side the dogs never see. So you need a command that will tell the dogs, hey, get on the other side of the canal. Um, so, Shirni is super, super easy to train. She's a, a Dutch Shepherd Malinois. She's super, super smart, super high desire to please. Boss, not that he's not necessarily that smart, he just, he is a sight hound slash pit bull. He doesn't have a huge desire to please. A lot of pit bulls do, but sight hounds really don't. They don't typically, the vast majority of the time, really give a crap what you think. And sight hounds in general are not very smart. So he's kind of got a couple things going against him. So I've tried many times to encourage boss across the river, but getting the idea through his head has just, it's like beating your head against a brick wall. Well, I was sitting there trying to think, what's a good way I could teach him to do that? And I realized uh, my grandpa had an old method he used to use with his herding dogs where he would tie his trained dog to an untrained dog and then give that trained dog commands. So they're out herding cattle or sheep or something and he'd say, go by, go away, you know, go left or right or go way out. He'd give these different commands to the dog and the trained dog would just go running and the untrained dog would just kind of follow along. And if it went astray at all, the trained dog would drag it in the right direction. Pretty soon that untrained dog starts realizing every time he says go by, every time he says go away, they're going a certain direction or they're doing a certain thing. And the dog begins to learn what the directions and commands mean. So I realized this was a similar situation. I had a dog who does not understand what I'm trying to say. I tell him something, he has no clue what I'm trying to say. She does because she's so smart and easy to train. I've already trained her this, even though I've had him twice as long as her. She's so much smarter and easier to train that it was just no big deal at all. Far side. Far side. Far side. Far side. Good dogs. Far side. Far side. Far side. Far side. Good dogs. Good dogs. Far side. Good girl. Far side. Good dog. Good dogs. 
Good dogs. Good dogs. Good dogs. Now this is just the beginning steps of training it. Eventually they need to learn to like start looking for things on the other side. But just for now, just getting them to actually follow the instructions to cross is good enough for now. We're just trying to get the basic idea of when I say far side, you cross the river. Okay, come on. Boss, your knee, come on. Come on. Good dogs. Good dogs, come on. Come on, boss. Come on, Shuni. Come on. Good girl. Come on. Come on. Oh, good dogs. Oh, good dogs. Oh, they're such good dogs. We give boss lots of praise. He doesn't really know why he's being praised, but we're praising him anyway. Good boy, boss. Okay, far side. Far side. Far side. Good boy, boss. Good boy. Far side. Good boy. Go, Shuni. Far side. Good dogs. Far side, boss. Good boy. Far side. Good boy. Good girl. <laughs> Worked like a charm. I wasn't positive to do it. Far side. Far side. Far side. I'm speaking too soon. Boss. Far side. Far side. Far side. Far side. Far side. Good boy. Good dog. You spoke too soon. Far side. Good boy. Good boy. Good dog. Good dog. Good dogs. Oh, good dogs. Good dogs. See, it's just basically a, a case of him not understanding what I'm saying. Now he understands what it means, so he's not super excited about doing it, but he's he's willing to do it. Once we get some slight real life situations where we're out hunting, and there's a raccoon on the other side, and he goes across and finds a raccoon, just a couple of lulls and he'll be super excited to go across. But for now, we just want him to be obedient and understand the command. Later, it'll be an exciting event for him. So when I'm not out filming videos, I'm here at the desk editing videos. Well, I know a lot of you guys don't really realize that work that goes into the videos I make. So a lot of you guys have the misconception that, um, you know, when we're doing videos, it's as simple as we go out, we film, we come back, the video's ready to go, we put it on YouTube. That's not even close to the case. So there's a lot of hours that go into, actually more hours that go into filming the video, go into editing the video. So for example, when we go out and do a big ratting, we typically have three or four cameras running at the same time, catching different angles, someone holding the camera, some are stationary. But we have three or four cameras rolling at once. And when we go out and do a big ratting like that, there's a lot of standing around. It, it literally is a solid, oh, four or five hours, sometimes only three hours, but it's, typically four or five hours of standing around, um, some of which is action packed. Other moments are very, very slow. We're waiting for things to happen. The mink's down a hole, nothing's happened for the last half hour. We just stood there staring at the hole. So you guys don't get to see how long it takes for us to film it to begin with, and then the editing that comes, comes after that. So if you can imagine, we have four different cameras that have five hours of footage on them each. So that's four times five, 20, hours of footage that I now have to upload onto here and go through and edit. So if you can imagine going through 20 hours of footage and getting that down to 20 minutes of usable, interesting, um, you know, YouTube or Vimeo worthy stuff, that takes a lot of time and effort to get that 20 hours down to 20 minutes. A lot of my time is spent here working on the computer. It's not all fun and games me running around hunting and training mink and training dogs, unfortunately. I would love it to be, but it, it's just not. Um, so what I do is I take this opportunity to try and do a little multitasking. I've got these little little uh, baby mink here. I have Axel and Saber. So what we do is while I'm editing, I try and spend as much time with these little guys as possible. If they're too rambunctious, I'll give one to Maggie or one to Olive. Olive, do you want to play with the baby mink? Here you go. And I'll let them play with one while I play with the other. Oh, you got a banana? Can Daddy eat it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Look, I need to fall. Oh, he's, I won't let him fall. So, if they're sleepy, they'll sit on my lap and play. If they're a little more rambunctious, like they kind of are right now, they're wanting to run around. If you look under here, I've got a litter box down underneath my desk. 
so that I could put them down and let them go to the bathroom. And they can kind of run around. And they could be by me. They could smell me. Ah, 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 ah. Hey, ah, ah. No, don't bite my toe. Um, they could smell me. They could be near me. Hey, quit biting my toe. No. No. Axel, no. They could be near me. Hey, Axel, no. Stop. They could be here. Yeah, see, you see how much fun this is. So, yeah, come here. So they can run around. If I'm holding them and they need to go to the bathroom, I just put them down there and they go. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to bond with these little mink while I'm working on the computer. So that, that takes obviously a lot of the time of my day. And um, yeah, that's where I'll leave you guys now. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, it was a little different from what I typically do. So I hope it was something that you guys actually appreciate and enjoy watching. And uh, let me know what you guys think. Put some, go ahead in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think of this video. And uh, we'll show you guys more next time. Thanks for watching. Alrighty, so I've had people on both YouTube and Vimeo bring to my attention a little bit of an issue, and that's that you're not being notified of when I post new videos. So the plan I've come up with to remedy this problem is to utilize a couple platforms that most people are on for the most part. I understand there's going to be exceptions and certain people won't be on these, but if you'd like to participate, I encourage you to join one of these two platforms. We're going to be using Instagram and Facebook to notify you guys of every new video I post. But I want to do more than that. I don't want to just have this be a, hey, I got a new video up kind of deal. I want to make this interesting and interactive for you guys. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to try and post on a much more regular basis than I do my videos. So once or twice a day or every other day when I get busy little kind of insights as to what I'm doing. So maybe a little picture, a short little video clip. These could be things that are family oriented, animal oriented, hunting oriented. So we'll be able to kind of hopefully accomplish two goals at, at once by doing this. So in the description below, in the description of every one of my videos from here on out, we're going to have a link to my Facebook page. It's called Minkinry and we're going to have a, a link to my Instagram. And if you guys follow at least one of those two, you should be getting the notifications about my videos as well as the other interesting stuff that I choose to post. 